Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds. Uh, I am Dr. Betsy Trowbridge, and I'm the Executive Vice Chair for the Department of Medicine, and I will be in Grand Rounds this morning. And we are very honored today uh, to have Grand Rounds by Dr. Ali Gardezi. And I love the title, it's Interventional Nephrology, Past, Present, and Future with an Exclamation Point. And this is an area I think that all of us uh, really need to understand uh, more fully. And so this will be, I think, extremely interesting. And I would like to also introduce Dr. Aji Gigiamali, who is the Division Chief for Nephrology. Um, in the years that we have been Division Chiefs together, I have seen um, the Division uh, grow significantly. Uh, the fellowship has become competitive and it's become an incredibly strong division in many areas. So Dr. Gigiamali, please introduce. Thank you, Betsy, uh, and I really appreciate the introduction. Everyone, good morning. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ali Gardezi, our Grand Round Speaker today to um, you. Dr. Gardezi received his medical degree from King Edward Medical College at the University of Punjab in Lahore, Pakistan, and came to the U.S. to complete his medical residency at Bronx Lebanon Hospital Center in Bronx, New York, and his nephrology training at the University of Wisconsin Madison with us, followed by his training in interventional nephrology. He was so great that we were fortunate to recruit him at the rank of assistant professor CHS in 2017. Dr. Gardezi is currently the director of our Interventional Nephrology Fellowship Program that has two trainees per year, and he's also leading our Point of Care Ultrasound Program. Dr. Gardezi has a 14 publications based on Web of Science, and uh, I would say most importantly that at a personal level is one of the most empathetic, calm, thoughtful, organized, and meticulous physicians I know the best kind of physician you want for interventional nephrology. I will also say that Dr. Gardezi is coming off two weeks of consults on acute nephrology services and has been preparing for his grand rounds. So please join me in welcoming Ali. Ali, platform is yours. Thank you, Dr. Jamali, for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, good morning, everyone, for joining us. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I would like to start by uh, thanking uh, uh, Gretchen Olson and uh, Clint here for helping me uh, get everything arranged. Um, and also uh, Dr. Goldberger for uh, um, helping me uh, fine tune my presentation. All right, so um, the, just give me one second. Get my presentation ready. If you um, put focus on PowerPoint, that should probably do it. All right, thank you. Okay, so, um, you know, whenever um, I tell someone from outside the nephrology world that uh, uh, I'm an international nephrologist, uh, the usual follow-up question which they have is, um, what does an interventional nephrologist do? And uh, uh, many medical students and residents uh, have told me that the first time they heard about interventional nephrology was uh, during their clinical rotations uh, in nephrology. So I thought it would be a good, good platform to uh, introduce the audience to interventional nephrology and uh, talk about its past, present, and future. I have no conflict of interest to disclose. And the learning objectives for this talk today are uh, that uh, the uh, listeners should be able to define interventional nephrology and identify the procedures which come under this field. They should be able to list the benefits of this field in improving the quality of end-stage kidney disease care and describe some of the novel technologies in the field of interventional nephrology. 
And in order to achieve uh, these objectives, I would start with a case which would highlight the importance of uh, dialysis access in patients with uh, end-stage kidney disease. And then I will take you on a little bit of time travel. We'll go into the past, see how that field developed. Uh, we'll then look at the present state of this field, the benefits and the outcomes, and then we'll take a peek in the future. And at the end, I will uh, quickly talk about training and career opportunities. So let's start with the case. A 68-year-old female with history of end-stage kidney disease on hemodialysis every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday via a right forearm AV graft presents to the dialysis unit on Friday morning. On exam, the nurse is not able to feel a thrill in the graft or hear a bruit on auscultation. Insertion of the needle into the graft does not produce a flash of blood. So what is the diagnosis? It is AV graft thrombosis. And what is the optimal management? It is thrombectomy of the graft with angioplasty of the culprit lesion. Now, there can be two different management scenarios here. In the first scenario, a patient uh, would be able to get the thrombectomy done immediately and uh, would be able to return uh, to get her dialysis the same day. And this is the best option with least patient mobility and healthcare costs. The second scenario is that she is not able to get the intervention the same day. If that happens, then she would need to get admitted to the hospital over the weekend because she is an end-stage kidney disease patient uh, without a working dialysis access. And she would need to be monitored closely for any urgent need for dialysis. And if a need arise, she would need to have a temporary dialysis catheter to put in. And hopefully on Monday, she would get an AV graft from back knee. This scenario would carry a higher patient morbidity and healthcare cost. And the reason this is important is because dialysis access is the lifeline of end-stage kidney disease patients. If there is no dialysis access, there is no dialysis. And if there is no dialysis, they cannot survive. And the reason we want uh, these complications to be taken care of right away is because any delay in treating things like thrombosis or stenosis carries a high risk of permanent access loss. And uh, that would increase dependency on uh, central venous catheter. And central venous catheters have poor outcomes. Uh, these two graphs are taken from two different studies in two different eras. The upper graph uh, is from a paper published by Dingra and colleagues in 2001. And it shows that the survival, survival probability of end-stage kidney disease patients uh, is the best with AV fistula and the worst with central venous catheter. And Robert Brown, uh, after 16 years uh, um, from the first study, showed the same results that uh, uh, central venous catheters carried the lowest survival probability for end-stage kidney disease patients. What are the different specialties which can uh, manage these complications? First is surgery, which could be vascular, transplant, or general surgery, depending upon the location. Uh, they can uh, take care of these issues either by surgical procedures or by endovascular procedures. But we all know that surgeons are very busy. They are spending a lot of time in the operating room doing all those uh, emergent and elective procedures. So their availability to do dialysis access uh, um, emergencies uh, at a very short notice is very limited. The next specialty which can take care of these uh, problems is interventional radiology. And they can do endovascular procedures but again, they have a very wide scope of practice. Uh, they do lots of different procedures uh, involving uh, multiple different organ systems. Uh, and all of those of us who have worked on the inpatient wards know how difficult it is to get a patient on IR schedule at few hours notice. Uh, the third specialty which can do these uh, uh, procedures is interventional nephrology. They can also do endovascular procedures. 
And because their scope is just limited to dialysis access, uh, they have uh, more availability to uh, deal with these complications immediately. And they're also in a unique position to uh, care for these patients, both from nephrology as well as interventional perspective. So this brings me to the definition of interventional nephrology. It is a nephrology subspeciality which deals with the maintenance of dialysis access. The procedures which are done under the scope of interventional nephrology include angiogram and angioplasty, stent placement, thrombectomy, tunneled central venous catheter insertion, peritoneal dialysis catheter insertion, arteriogram and venogram for access creation planning. Kidney biopsy is done by many general and transplant nephrologists and does not come under the purview of interventional nephrology. Now, I want to show you uh, a few pictures of uh, some of the procedures which we do. Let's start with the thrombectomy of the AV graft, similar to the case which I presented. So uh, you can see here that the contrast is just pooling into the graft uh, and not uh, flowing forward. And then you can also uh, see some white uh, filling defects, which are all clots. So once we uh, did the thrombectomy and did the angioplasty of the culprit lesion at the end of the procedure, uh, the graft looked like this with uh, freely flowing uh, contrast without uh, any more clots in it. Let's look at another uh, uh, procedure, fistulogram with angioplasty and stent placement. So in this first picture, uh, you would notice that there is a very tight uh, stenosis in the outflow of the fistula. So we uh, placed a balloon there, did the angioplasty, and uh, after the angioplasty, it looked like that. So a little better, but still not uh, completely open. So we decided to place a stent. And after the stent placement, uh, it looked uh, like this with uh, a much better flow uh, from the fistula. So now that we understand uh, what is interventional nephrology, let's look into the past and see how this uh, field developed. So it all started in 1945 when a Dutch scientist named Willem Johan Kolf uh, was uh, successfully able to do first ever dialysis on a 61 year old uh, uh, woman who had uremia. He had been trying uh, his machine for a few years before he became successful. And uh, um, after that, dialysis became more common in uh, practice, but the problem was that every time someone needed dialysis, they had to have needles put in, in their uh, arteries and the veins. And those repeated needlings uh, caused a lot of damage to the blood vessels. So another brilliant scientist named Belding Scribner for, from Seattle, Washington, devised uh, a shunt uh, in 1960, which could be used to take the blood to and from the machine. He connected that shunt to the radial artery on one side and cephalic vein on the other side, and he used it in uh, multiple patients uh, with uh, good success. In fact, the very first patient which he used it, uh, he was able to do dialysis for 10 years. Uh, but the problem with these shunts was that uh, they carried high risk of infection because they were external, and uh, they stopped working after every two to three months, so they had to be replaced. Around the same time, there was another scientist in London, England, uh, Stanley Sheldon, who was looking for a surgeon who could put uh, Scribner shunts for his dialysis patients, but he was not able to find anyone. So that necessity led him to devise the first ever dialysis catheters. He uh, placed two catheters in the femoral vein and he left them there. So the patients used to come get their uh, dialysis through those catheters and used to keep those catheters in their femoral veins. A few years after that, another scientist named Henry Tenkoff devised the, uh, a peritoneal dialysis catheter, which could be placed and left in the peritoneal cavity for a long time without the risk of dysfunction or infection. And his catheter design was so successful that even after 50 years, this is uh, still the most common uh, catheter design which is in use. A year after that, uh, J.R. Semino and Michael Brescia uh, devised the first ever natural arteriovenous shunt, 
a fistula. And the story goes that uh, Simino was a phlebotomist at uh, Bellevue Hospital in New York. And uh, he saw a few uh, Korean War veterans who had uh, fistulas in their arms because of uh, gunshot injuries. And he noticed that it was very easy to feel those fistulas and put needles in them to draw blood. And that gave him the idea of uh, uh, creating a fistula to use it for dialysis. And then finally, uh, Wilbert Gore and his son, Robert Gore, devised uh, a material called Gore-Tex which uh, could be easily placed inside the skin and connected to an artery and a vein, uh, which resulted in formation of AV crafts. So all these pioneers were uh, not necessarily nephrologists or radiologists or surgeons. They were scientists who were interested in the field of uh, dialysis and dialysis access. But after that, the dialysis uh, field diversified. And the tipping point was 1973. That year, uh, there was an amendment passed in the Social Security Act, which allowed Medicare to cover expenses for all dialysis patients. Prior to that, dialysis was offered only to the patients who were uh, young, otherwise healthy, and had a good quality of life. But after that, more and more patients started doing dialysis, and many of those patients were sicker and older. Uh, and what we noticed in those patients was that there was a higher incidence of fistula failure. Around the same time, the nephrologist started putting more focus on the science of dialysis itself and moved away from the dialysis access. And that responsibility came on the shoulders of surgeons. And because there was a lot of fistula failures, uh, there was a gradual move towards putting more grafts and catheters because uh, with those, you had immediate success in using them. Uh, but by 1980s, uh, the nephrologists realized that their patients were not getting uh, the optimal or efficient dialysis access care. So they started looking for ways to uh, reduce the over-reliance on other specialties. So uh, Stephen Ash devised the first ever method of uh, putting peritoneal dialysis catheters percutaneously at the patient's bedside by nephrologist, and that uh, greatly increased the utilization of PD. Um, and then by that time, the endovascular techniques also became more common, and uh, it was realized that uh, those uh, uh, procedures could be used to maintain and repair the fistulas and grafts. So the responsibility of uh, dialysis access care shifted from the surgeons to interventional nephrologist, uh, interventional radiologist. And although the efficiency did increase, but then again, there was the same issue that interventional radiologists were busy with lots of other procedures. So the uh, dialysis patients were not able to get immediate care for their dialysis access. So at that time, another visionary nephrologist named Gerald Bethard uh, decided to learn these endovascular techniques uh, by himself. And then he started using it in his patients. And once he became good at it, he started teaching others. He is considered the father of interventional nephrology. So in 90s, uh, pioneers like Ash and uh, Bethard, they started training other nephrologists in this field. And that's how the field of interventional nephrology slowly grew. And uh, uh, when there were enough nephrologists with interest in dialysis access care, they made a society for their own, American Society of Diagnostic and Interventional Nephrology, which was founded in uh, 2000. And, uh, Ever since, it has done a tremendous job in advancing the field of interventional nephrology. So now that we have uh, understood why and how uh, interventional nephrology uh, came into being, let's uh, look at how it has done in the uh, past 20 years. So I would start with the current state of the field. This is a graph which is uh, taken from a publication in Journal of Vascular and Interventional Radiology in 2018. And it shows the trend of uh, fistulograms performed every year from 2005 to 2015. And as you can see that uh, there has been a great increase in the number of fistulograms performed every year. But if you look at this uh, breakdown, uh, according to different specialities, you would notice that most of this increase is because of the increase in the number of procedures done by the medicine specialties. 
uh, indicated by the uh, the middle line. Uh, and then if you look at uh, the absolute numbers between 2005 and 2015, uh, in radiology, there was only 2.81% increase in uh, the dialysis access procedures. But for nephrology, there was uh, the increase was whopping 250%. And for surgery, it was about 205%. So back in 2005, almost two thirds of these procedures were done by interventional radiology. But within 10 years, the, uh, those procedures were kind of equally divided between medicine, surgery, and radiology. Now, when we talk about different uh, locations where uh, these procedures are done, there are three different practice types. First is the hospital-based practice where the procedures are done in interventional radiology suit or cardiac cath lab. Uh, the space is usually shared between multiple different specialties. That is the model which we have in our hospital. The second model is uh, freestanding office-based dialysis access centers. So these uh, uh, access centers are strategically developed either within the same building as the dialysis unit or very close to it. And the benefit is that if uh, a patient shows up for his dialysis and his or her access is not working, they can easily be taken to the procedure room right away and then their access can be uh, repaired and then they can uh, go back to the dialysis unit to get their treatment. The third model is ambulatory surgery center, uh, where uh, uh, the surgeons and the interventional nephrologist uh, work closely with each other. The surgeons create the accesses, whereas the interventional nephrologists uh, uh, maintain them and repair them. Now, among these three practices, it is the second one, the office space dialysis access centers, which have created the greatest impact. Uh, as an example, there were only 58 of these centers uh, across the country in 2004, but by 2013, they were up to 210. And what they have done is that they have moved these procedures from the inpatient world to the outpatient world. As shown by this graph, uh, which is again taken from the same study uh, from JVIR, uh, it shows the uh, number of these procedures which are done in the outpatient world according to the specialties. And again, the medicine specialities have uh, uh, contributed the greatest in that move. Now, when the interventional nephrologists started doing these procedures, uh, there was a concern raised by both uh, radiology as well as surgery that because they're not formally trained in doing these procedures, uh, they would not have a good success rate and they would have higher complication rates. But multiple studies have been done in past uh, uh, 15 years, which uh, have helped resolve some of these concerns. This is a paper published by Dr. Uh, Bathard in 2015. In this paper, he compares uh, two of his own studies. The first one was done in 2004, where he looked at the success rate and the complication rates of uh, 11 dialysis access centers across the country run by 29 interventional nephrologists. And then in 2014, he repeated the, the same, same study with the 65 uh, dialysis uh, access centers run by more than 100 interventional nephrologists. And what he found was that uh, in 2004, uh, uh, there were a total of 14,000 procedures done and the success rate was 96%. But by 2014, that number increased to almost 69,000. And even with that high number, the success rate was uh, still 98%. He also looked at the complications, which he divided into major and minor based on uh, Society of Interventional Radiology criteria. Minor being the ones which only needed observation, whereas major were those which needed any active management, hospitalization, or uh, higher level of care. So the minor complication rates were 3.26% in 2004, but went down to 1.17 by 2014. Whereas the major complication rates were only 0.28 uh, in 2004, and they went even further down to only 0.16. And these are much lower compared to the threshold which is set forth by the Society of Interventional Radiology. Now, the other concern was uh, uh, whether uh, conscious sedation and anesthesia can be given safely in these outpatient centers. 
and uh, Dr. Bethard looked at uh, uh, this outcome as well in uh, uh, 13,000 procedures. And he noticed that there were only 17 sedation and anesthesia related side effects in those 13,000 procedures. So just 0.1%. And uh, most of these uh, uh, side effects were in the high risk population, which uh, were high risk because of their age or comorbidities. And then he also looked at the radiation safety because that was another concern whether nephrologists would be able to safely use uh, fluoroscopy and radiation. And he looked at the fluoroscopy time and radiation doses for multiple different procedures. And what these numbers tell us is that uh, the, both the time and the radiation dose was much lower compared to the standards put in by Society of Interventional Radiology. And although there were no head-to-head -head studies between IR and IN, but uh, uh, if uh, we look at uh, some of the studies uh, done on these procedures in the interventional radiology world, we would notice that the, the radiation doses used by interventional nephrology were about three to eight times less compared to the ones which are used by radiology. And the reason for that is not because nephrologists can run these machines uh, better, but it's just that because they do just limited number of these procedures again and again, so they develop good reflexes. So it takes them uh, faster uh, to uh, accomplish the, the results with the very little radiation. When we talk about the peritoneal dialysis catheter outcomes, uh, multiple studies have compared uh, surgical placement by the surgeons versus percutaneous placement by interventional nephrology. And I'm quoting a meta-analysis, which was done by our group in 2015. We looked at 13 studies with uh, uh, almost 2,700 patients, and we found that there was no difference in one-year catheter survival, dysfunction, or leaks. And the peritonitis rates were lower in the percutaneous placement compared to the surgical placement. So these procedures at the hands of, uh, in the hands of interventional nephrologists uh, uh, have pretty good outcomes. Now let's look at uh, whether this field has made any difference in patient care. Uh, and we will start with the, uh, the hospitalizations and mistreatments. This was looked at by Mishler and colleagues uh, who published their findings in 2006. They looked at the dialysis access related hospitalizations and mistreatments in uh, uh, 21 uh, dialysis uh, uh, centers across the Phoenix metro area, which is represented by the red line. And then they compared these to a national cohort of a large dialysis organization indicated by the blue line. And uh, they looked uh, at these outcomes from 1995 to 2002. And the interesting thing is that in uh, 1997, they started a dialysis access center. So what they found was that uh, both the hospitalization rates as well as the mistreatment rates were almost equal to the national cohort prior to the dialysis access center. Uh, uh, and then after the dialysis access center was started, those uh, uh, rates uh, started coming down. And by the end of the uh, study, they were significantly better than the national cohort. The next impact which I want to talk about is the reduction in the cost. This is a study by Dobson and colleagues. They looked at uh, Medicare claims data for uh, uh, dialysis vascular access procedures in two cohorts. First cohort got their uh, procedures done in an outpatient access center, whereas uh, the other cohort got their procedures done in a hospital-based center. And uh, what they did was that they did propensity matching of these two cohorts to take away the selection bias. And what they found was that dialysis vascular access payments per patient per month were $626 less in the outpatient access center compared to the hospital-based access center. And so it's $626 for one patient per month, which is about $7,500 a year. And uh, there, there are almost half a million patients who are on dialysis. So you guys can do the math and see uh, that uh, these outpatient access centers are saving billions of dollars. The next impact is improvement in fistula utilization. As I mentioned that uh, fistulas carry the 
best survival probability for these patients. Uh, this is a study called TOPS study which was done at the turn of century when uh, uh, interventional nephrology was still in its infancy. And it's a multinational uh, observation study which looked at different dialysis outcomes in seven developed countries. Here, uh, uh, they uh, report the utilization of different type of dialysis accesses in different countries. And uh, uh, as you can see that uh, uh, the AV fistula utilization was the lowest in the United States, just 24%, compared to some of the other countries like Japan and Italy, where it was more than 90%. So after that, there were multiple initiatives which were done by the government and the dialysis units and the nephrologist to improve the fistula utilization. And the most important one was the fistula first initiative, which was started in 2003. And interventional nephrologists were at the forefront of this uh, um, initiative uh, and, and were making sure that these fistulas uh, continue to be maintained and they continue to work longer. And uh, the result of those efforts was that uh, since then, the uh, fistula utilization has slowly increased, as you can see the, by these blue bars in this graph. Uh, so it was about 30% in 2000. Uh, three and went up to almost 60% by 2011. Now it's uh, hovering around 70%. And then finally, uh, interventional nephrologists have also helped increase the PD utilization. This was looked at by RF Asif and colleagues in 2005. They looked at three centers where interventional nephrologists started placing PD catheters. And they looked at uh, the increase in the number of PD uh, patients in those centers. So this is a graph from one of the centers. The gray bars indicate uh, the time when the surgeons were putting the catheters and the black bars indicate the time when interventional nephrologists started putting these catheters. And as you can see that the number of patients uh, increased significantly after that. Uh, they also looked at uh, uh, the PD utilization in these three centers and compared it to the national uh, average. And they found that uh, PD utilization was much better in these three centers compared to nation. So interventional nephrology has helped reduce hospitalizations, costs, and they have helped improve uh, fistula utilization and PD utilization. Now let's look into the future. One thing is for sure, there is a growing need. I'm going to show you a few slides from United States renal data system. The first slide is uh, the adjusted incidence of end-stage renal disease in past 30 years. And you can see that it has kind of stabilized in past 20 years, and in fact, reduced a little bit in past decade. Uh, but the prevalence of end-stage renal disease has continued to go up. What is the reason for that? The reason is that uh, around the same time, the mortality of patients on dialysis have gone down as well. So there are more patients which are coming into the pool, but less patients are leaving because of death. And as a result, that pool is expanding. And that expansion is still happening mostly in dialysis rather than transplant. So there are more patients who are doing dialysis. So they would need more interventional nephrologists to take care of their dialysis access. And then there are challenges as well. These patients are living longer, so they need to have a comprehensive end-stage kidney disease life plan. And their dialysis access is at the front and center of that life plan. They need those dialysis accesses which last longer so that the patients don't outlive their dialysis access. And then despite all the efforts which have been put in in past 15 years, the central venous catheter use still remains high. In fact, 80% of the patients still start with a catheter. Most of them do end up uh, getting a fistula or a graft later, but they're still exposed to the catheter for some time. And when we talk about the fistulas, uh, there is uh, a high rate of primary failure of the fistulas. So about one third of the fistulas never reach the point where they are mature enough to be used. And then when we talk about the grafts, uh, there is a high risk of uh, thrombosis. About 40% of them thrombose within a year. 
And then catheters, uh, they carry high risk of infection and dysfunction. So whenever there are challenges, there is opportunity to innovate. And when there's opportunity to innovate, it brings new and exciting technologies. And I'm going to talk about a few of them in the next few slides. The first one which I wanna talk about is endovascular AV fistula creation. This is creation of a fistula between an artery and a vein using endovascular techniques without the need for surgery. So what we do in this is that we would gain access to an artery and a vein where we want to create the fistula. And then we introduce magnets in that artery and a vein. And those magnets would attach to each other and bring the artery and the vein in close approximation to each other. And then we can pass uh, radio frequency through an electrode, which is there in the middle of that uh, magnet, which would burn a hole from the vein to the artery, creating the fistula. But we can only create those fistulas in the deep venous system of the arm because that's where the artery and the veins are close to each other. Uh, but we cannot use those uh, to cannulate uh, the veins uh, because those are deeper. So they have to have a communication to the superficial veins uh, so that uh, all that high pressure blood can uh, travel from the deep veins to the superficial veins and then the superficial veins can be used for cannulation. And that open communication is a perforator vein. So they have to have a patent perforator vein for the blood to be directed from the deep veins to the superficial veins. And then the superficial veins can be used to uh, cannulate for dialysis. And uh, there are two different devices which have been FDA approved. And uh, I would uh, like to show you the video schematics of uh, those uh, devices. The first one is the Wavelink device. In this device, we uh, would uh, place, uh, uh, access the artery and the vein, usually the brachial artery and brachial vein, and then we would pass the magnets down to the artery and the vein where we want to create the fistula, usually the ulnar artery and the ulnar vein. And as you can see that there's an electrode right in the middle. Once the magnets approximate and the vein and artery are closed, then we would pass the radio frequency, which would uh, make uh, an opening between the artery and the vein creating the fistula. And then through the perforator vein, the blood would go into the superficial veins. The next uh, technology is ellipsis technology. In this technology, we only gain one access into the median cubital vein. And from there, we would pass the needle down to the perforator. And from perforator, we actually go into the radial artery. And then we pass a wire from the vein going into the artery and then an introducer sheath is passed over the wire. The tip of that sheath ends in the artery. And then through this sheath, we would uh, introduce the device which has uh, two electrodes. One is at the tip and the other one is at the base. The tip electrode would end in the artery, whereas the base electrode would stay in the vein. And then those are approximated to each other so that they are in contact. And then the radio frequency is passed which would create the opening between the artery and the vein, creating the fistula. So these two devices were uh, approved by, uh, before that, I would like to show you the, uh, the images of a procedure which I did a few months ago. So this uh, uh, is just an arteriogram taken from the brachial artery. You can see the brachial artery dividing into radial artery and ulnar artery, and then, this is a picture of those electrodes uh, and the magnets. And uh, you will see that once the radio frequency is passed, the electrode would move right here. And then at the end, when uh, we take a similar picture from the brachial artery, it would look like this. So from the brachial artery, blood would flow through the fistula back up into the veins. And this is one of the most uh, satisfying image uh, for an interventional nephrologist. So coming back to the FDA approval, it was done in 2018. Uh, and then it was based on uh, uh, two different trials. For the Wavelink, uh, the NEAT trial was done mainly in Canada, Australia, and New Zealand. It had 80 patients and their success rate was around 80%. And 84% uh, of those fistulas were still functional at one year. 
for the ellipsis, uh, the ellipsis US pivotal trial was done in 2018. It had 102 patients and their success rate was 86% and almost 87% of those uh, fistulas were still uh, functional at one year. The next device I wanna talk about is uh, inside out catheter device. So we all know that if uh, uh, a central line is put in, in the IJ vein or the subclavian vein, it uh, uh, causes a high risk of thrombosis. And if those veins thrombose, then uh, it's almost impossible to use them again to put catheters. So this device helps navigate uh, this problem. So in this device, we would uh, gain access to the femoral vein and from there we would advance a catheter which would go up through the IVC, SVC, right up to where the clots are in the IJ and the subclavian vein. And through that catheter we would pass a device which has a sharp end which can go easily through the clot. And then there is a skin marker which is placed on the skin and we align the device to that marker such that the hole in the, at the end of the device is right in the middle of that marker. And then we would advance a short tip, uh, stiff wire out from the vein to the skin in the opposite direction of the usual way of putting these catheters. Once we have the wire going across, then we can easily place uh, an introducer over the wire. And then we can uh, introduce the dialysis catheter through that introducer sheath uh, ending into uh, the lower SVC. And that way uh, uh, we are able to use a thrombosed vein to put a dialysis catheter and save the other veins. This uh, trial was uh, FDA approved uh, in 2020 based on a SAVE US trial, <clears throat> which was an investigational device exemption study. Uh, they had 30 patients and their success rate was 90%. And there was no device or procedure related adverse effects. <clears throat> and then the list goes on. There are a lot of other things which are still in the pipeline. They are still being trialed. I'll mention a few. Uh, these are bioengineered human acellular vessels. Uh, they are, these are made in vitro uh, with the uh, vascular smooth muscle cells. And then uh, uh, the hope is that the grafts made out of these vessels <clears throat> would last longer and uh, would not have the same uh, problem as the synthetic grafts. Nitric oxide eluting uh, catheter hub caps are being tried. Uh, so the idea is that uh, they would release nitric oxide, which would prevent clotting and uh, biofilm uh, production inside the catheter. And it would also reduce colonization of the catheters. And then finally, uh, renal stem cell injections are also being tested. In this, uh, uh, the, the cortical tissue is uh, taken with a biopsy and then renal progenitor cells are um, isolated. Then they are expanded and injected back into the cortex of the patient. After injection, they would migrate to the areas which are damaged. And then they would integrate into the tissue and help repair and regenerate nephrons. So the hope is that this uh, technique would prevent uh, progression of chronic kidney disease. So lots of exciting things which uh, are in the pipeline. So now that I've talked about all that, I'm hopeful that some of you might be thinking about uh, interventional nephrology as a career. So I wanted to add some information about training and career opportunities. So uh, in terms of training, uh, there are a few dedicated one-year interventional nephrology fellowship programs. Uh, our program is one of them. Then there are also um, uh, other nephrology fellowship programs which do not have a dedicated interventional nephrology fellowship, but they have interventional nephrologists uh, who do procedures and they are uh, willing to train their general nephrology fellows during their two years of fellowship in these procedures. And then the third option is uh, uh, that certain uh, private dialysis access centers also offer training opportunities. When it comes to the career, um, the interventional nephrologist can either work in the private uh, world with uh, nephrology groups and work in freestanding dialysis access centers, but they can also pursue an academic interventional nephrology career where they would have the opportunity to train others and also do research uh, in this field. 
and then they can either do 100% interventional nephrology or they can do a mix of general and interventional nephrology. And then finally, I would uh, uh, quickly talk about our program here. Uh, the UW Interventional Nephrology program was started in 2004. The fellowship was started in 2008. And uh, since then, uh, there are 13 fellows who have graduated and have gone on to have very successful careers, both in the academic as well as private field. Here, uh, we ha currently have three interventional nephrologists. All three are alumni of this program. And we work in two practice locations, including the UW Hospital and Meritor Hospital. And we have a very wide referral base. As uh, shown by this map, uh, it's about 50 mile radius around the medicine area. And uh, we do about 1,000 procedures every year. And uh, since its uh, inception, the interventional nephrology program has helped improve the AV fistula rates in our dialysis units, as shown by this graph. The orange line indicates the prevalence of AV fistula use over the years, and the blue line indicates the prevalence of catheter use over the years. And it has also helped increase our PD population, as shown by this graph, showing the number of PD patients with each year. And uh, this year, we uh, were able to get approval for an additional interventional nephrology fellowship position. So we are the only program in the country now which have two dedicated interventional nephrology fellowship positions. So with that, I would come to my conclusion. Interventional nephrology is a relatively new subspeciality dealing with care of dialysis access. It has added a whole new dimension to the practice and career in nephrology. It has impacted important outcomes like quality and efficiency of care, increase in fistula use, decrease in catheter use, and lower cost. And it is well-placed to become even more exciting and impactful with the upcoming devices and technologies. And there are plenty of training and career opportunities for those who are interested. And with that, I would finish here and I would be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you very much. And congratulations on an incredibly successful fellowship. So, you know, I'll start with the first question, which is, you know, in the fellowship, uh, increasing an, a fellow uh, in this interventional area, how many, you know, at what, how many interventional uh, nephrologists are, do we need in this country? Uh, and do we have a very significant short supply or, you know, or is it years till we reach the status quo or how many people do we need to train here? Yeah, so, uh, you know, as I mentioned that uh, uh, the number of patients who are on dialysis have been increasing. So there's definitely, you know, growing need and, uh, uh, you know, there are more dialysis centers which are opening. Uh, so we need many more uh, interventional nephrologists. When it comes to training, uh, you know, unfortunately, there are not a lot of uh, uh, university training programs. In fact, there are only five or six which offer these uh, uh, fellowships. You know, most of the training is still done, uh, you know, informally in outpatient dialysis access center. So this is a area of need. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned, American Society of Diagnostic and Interventional Nephrology, they've been working closely with multiple different academic centers especially those who have interventional nephrologists to start uh, formal interventional nephrology fellowship programs. So, uh, you know, there is definitely a lot of need and, uh, uh, you know, there's not enough infrastructure to meet that need right now. Thank you. So a, a question from Philip Cohen. Uh, this is a limited anatomical location and limited procedure. Why can't it be relegated, for example, to a physician's assistant who would require less training and presumably less cost in terms of billing? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, you know, some of the physician assistants also do these procedures, uh, mainly in the interventional radiology field. Um, the issue is that uh, apart from the, the procedure itself, which is very complicated. You know, uh, uh, every fistulogram is entirely different from each other. You know, uh, the anatomy is different, the severity of the, uh, 
the illness and the, the lesion is different. But apart from that, you know, you have to take into account the, the overall picture of the patient as well. What is his or her dialysis needs? You know, how much aggressive we can be looking at their comorbidities. So, uh, you know, that makes it a little bit more complicated, but there's no reason why a physician assistant who does it for a long time can get good at it. Definitely that, that is something which uh, if, uh, you know, we are not able to produce enough interventional nephrologists uh, uh, through physicians, the physician uh, assistants can uh, fill that uh, void. Uh, and I am another, uh, just a comment for you, uh, uh, Judy Geiser said, uh, thank you for a wonderful presentation and for sharing this new technology. My professional background is hemodialysis and vascular access. So you really hit the spot there. And uh, Aji, do you wanna go ahead and unmute and ask your question, please? Sure, thank you, Ali. This was a wonderful presentation and uh, really informative. Can you tell us a bit about the uh, operational challenges and opportunities to lead, build, and lead a multidisciplinary interventional nephrology program? Yeah, so uh, you know the uh, one of the biggest challenges is to create an environment where uh, the interventional nephrologists, uh, vascular surgeons, and uh, uh, interventional radiologists can work, uh, uh, you know, uh, in conjunction with each other. Uh, thankfully, here in our uh, institution, we have been able to build that multidisciplinary uh, 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 team where we have, we, are, we work very closely with the vascular surgeons, interventional radiologists, and uh, interventional nephrologists. Um, and this is uh, the model which uh, I think needs to be uh, uh, built in, uh, in, in those hospitals which are aspiring to start interventional nephrology uh, programs. Um, once we have that level of cooperation that is helpful uh, you know, for the patients as well, it increases the efficiency and it increases the, uh, the probability of uh, getting a fistula or a graft ready for a patient before they start dialysis and reducing uh, the, the catheter prevalence which we have. Thank you. Thank you. Another question. These are all very uh, diverse uh, questions. Let me just um, just popped out of here. Wait a second. Let me go pop up a little bit more. So, uh, from Jackie uh, Cruiser, what role do you see? Is, what do you see as the role of interventional radiology in shared decision making about whether to initiate, continue, limit, or stop dialysis? Uh, I would assume it's interventional nephrology, or is it interventional yeah. radiology? Yeah, interventional nephrology, yeah. Your role, so what would your role be? Mm -hmm. Right, right, yeah. so yeah, so the role is uh, uh, very central. Uh, the reason is that uh, because interventional nephrologists work very uh, closely on dialysis access, they uh, know the history of uh, dialysis access for a specific patient, and they also know what other options are available. So uh, if, uh, you know, someone is running out of options, you know, then uh, uh, interventional nephrologist is uh, well-placed in a position to talk to the patient and the family about, uh, you know, their goals of care if they are running out of dialysis options, access options. Uh, the other thing is uh, uh, they can also, they also understand how much would be the risk of uh, uh, a certain patient uh, getting more aggressive uh, management, you know, whether they are able to uh, handle those, uh, uh, you know, aggressive uh, treatments or not. So that's another area where uh, interventional nephrologists can uh, help the, the patient's nephrologist and the patient and uh, his or her family make a good informed decision. Excellent. A uh, 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 comment from Dr. John McCarthy, with these advanced hemodialysis access options for end-stage renal disease, needing other, with people needing other prolonged IV access, what is the best option for compatibility with PICC lines and other things? Right, that's a very good question. Um, you know, so people who are, uh, uh, who have advanced chronic kidney disease and where you anticipate that they would need uh, uh, to start dialysis, uh, you know, within the next one to two years, it is extremely important to uh, save their veins of their arms 
you know, so that we can use them for future access. So uh, the best thing uh, to have a long term access like a pick line in these uh, patients is to get it in uh, the IJ or the EJ veins, you know, which uh, are not included in the circuit, which is used for AV fistulas and AV grafts. So, uh, you know, that way we can save veins like cephalic vein and basilic vein for future fistula uh, creation. Um, you know, and put the big lines in the IJ or the EJ veins. Mm -hmm. uh, and an, another question along the line of access uh, for Ravi Dingra, who said you did a fantastic job, first of all. Uh, and then uh, he says, uh, Ravi says, can you comment on AV fistula versus catheter for access in patients with HF? I see more complications related to um, AVF. Right, that's a very good question. So, uh, you know, uh, if uh, a patient has heart failure and they uh, get a fistula, definitely the, the flow going back to the heart increases and uh, that uh, increase the risk of uh, heart failure. Uh, but it depends on how much the flow is. You know, usually the heart failure is seen in patients who have uh, fistula flows in excess of 1500 ml uh, per second. So, if uh, the access flow is not that high, if uh, you know the fistula is not big, where uh, you know a lot of blood is flowing, then this can be prevented. And this is one of the benefits of the newer technologies, which I mentioned, uh, the endovascular AV fistula technologies, because they are a little bit more distal in the arm, and uh, the flow is divided uh, uh, between two or three different vessels rather than just one vessel that would reduce the flow uh, back to the heart. Uh, it would not be as high as uh, in a traditional fistula. And that would certainly reduce the risk of heart failure. Uh, but, you know, it all depends on uh, the overall picture of the patient, you know, what, their, uh, what is their uh, uh, prognosis. If someone has advanced heart failure and they have reached a point where they need dialysis, their uh, uh, life expectancy is not very good. You know, they don't survive for too long uh, on dialysis. So in those patients, doing dialysis with a catheter is totally fine. Excellent. Well, thank you. I think those were really fantastic questions that, that, that were across a spectrum of things. And so once again, thanks. This was a fantastic grand rounds. I think for everyone, have a great weekend. And Aji, any closing words? No, just uh, thank you very much, Ali. This was absolutely outstanding. Thank you, yeah. Betsy, and uh, all the best for the weekend to everyone. Yes. Thank you. All right. Thank Goodbye, you, everyone. Bye. Ali, this was so great. So excellent job. Thank